Hi, this is Jim Swallow. Welcome back to the second chapter of the story of how I restored a 1990 Miata and converted it into an electric car. In the first chapter, I discussed how I came up with the idea, how I acquired the Miata from my aunt in Moab, Utah, then brought it home and set it up for a project that I hoped I could do in under two years. The first step was to dismantle and clean the entire car. As I said in the first chapter, the inside and outside of this car was covered with dust and dirt. There had been a lot of sun damage. So the cleanup required a lot of effort. I used compressed air, vacuuming, brushing, rubbing with rags and cleaning agents. Once I'd done that, I started taking off a few things I was able to take off. The front bumper, the hood. I got into the trunk that was in pretty bad shape and got it all cleaned out. The battery's in the trunk, as you notice here, and uh, so we have to clean all this stuff out. Meanwhile, once I got into the trunk, I was concerned about how much of the electrical worked, and so I hooked the battery terminals to the truck and found, again, much to my delight, that things worked. The turn signals, lights, windows. So I was pretty happy about that. I got that left front fender off, and then came time to take off the wheels. I'll tell you about how I dealt with those a little bit later. And it was time to get it suspended up onto some blocks. Now here I violate the basic rules of supporting your car up on supports. You're supposed to use a completely level, solid surface. And uh, it turned out that each one of the corners of my support was a different height, and that led to some problems. But I did get it set finally. And at that point, there was a lot more ease of access underneath. When I thought about the amount of time I was going to be spending under this car, I was reminded of a picture I saw many years ago that suggested one reason as to why women tend to live longer than men. Now it's time to give everything I can a thorough power washing. I power wash all around the outside, in the engine compartment, back around in the trunk, and underneath. Then it's time to attack the interior. Let's start with the doors. First I remove the paneling, then get down to the inner workings of the door itself, clean out the latching, unlatching, and locking mechanism, and then work on the power windows. I clean and grease the tracks that the windows roll up and down on, lubricate the rest of the mechanism, and I'm pretty happy with how the electric windows work. Yes, the interior looked pretty bad, but it was mainly just a lot of dirt, dust, and sun damage. I was amazed at how little wear there was inside. Once I got the carpets and seats cleaned, there wasn't really very much wear on them. Next, the center console gets removed. Then it's time to remove the seats. Once the seats are out, then it's easier to access the inside to do my thorough cleaning. Next comes the steering wheel and all its appendages. The hood over the instrument cluster comes off. The instrument cluster comes out. The vent nozzles come out. I'm careful to mark all of the cables that get 
disconnected from each other, so I know what to plug back in when time comes to put it back together. And finally, out comes the dashboard. All of the guts of the air conditioning system, which I don't plan to use. And now I've got everything out, and we can see all the way up to the firewall. Meanwhile, I also removed the luggage rack from the trunk, which I have no intention of using, and I think it looks kind of ugly anyway. I pull off all the molding around the windshield, since the windshield is going to have to be replaced. It's got a big crack and a big scrape in it. And the center console and dash get moved to my workshop, where they spend the next six months slowly getting cleaned up and put back together again. The dash was cracked in a couple of places, and I did have to repair that. I had to zip tie this one area together because there was no way that I was able to pull it together with clamps. I used epoxy glue and generally at least got the job done, but I'm not fully happy with the repair. Hopefully when I get everything cleaned up and put it back into the car, it won't be too noticeable. Next comes the removal of the motor, ignition and carburation system, cooling system, exhaust, and other attachments. Everything comes out reasonably easy, except there are the occasional 45-minute bolts. You know, most bolts will come out within a few seconds to a minute, but then there's that occasional bolt take a half an hour or even up to an hour to get out. But with patience and perseverance, we're finally ready to pull the engine. With a little help from my friends, I put up a temporary hoisting system, which actually works quite well. And pretty soon, the engine is out of there. I roll the car back into the garage where it'll spend the next eight months, and I finally attack the gas tank. This sits right behind the seats and directly over the rear axle, and was a little bit of a effort to remove, but cutting and grinding and unbolting and pulling finally removes the gas tank, and I have an open spot where I plan to put batteries in. After cleanup and reupholstering, this area will be perfect for 150 pounds or so of batteries. By now, I've developed a pretty significant discard pile. After all this was over, I called a scrap metal guy who came by and picked up all this and the old motor, and away it went. So this concludes the second chapter of my story of creating an electric Miata. Hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned for the next chapter when I develop my color scheme, paint the car, do the wheels and start to put everything back together.